Uh, hi, I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and uh, this is Politics for People Who Hate Politics for uh, the lovely, lovely website, Liberty.me. And today, as usual, we've had some bumps in terms of getting a panel together, but we have um, exciting people, and we have someone who's going to join us a little later. But we're going to start. Um, we've got Joe Steigerwald, who is my brother, and he's pretty all right, and he plays bass guitar in a band. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Joe. And Glad to be here. No, it's not. Um, and we also have Jeffrey Tucker, <laughs> the Chief Liberty Officer of Liberty.me and a Distinguished Fellow at the um, Foundation for Economic Education. Well, I'm, I'm actually thrilled that you in, you invited me. Actually, I mean, you know, it was it it was a long time coming, and uh, I'm I'm just glad. I mean, your podcast has been around now for a couple of months, and this is my my first time. So, thank you. Thank you. I had to work up to it. Manuel told me it would be okay, <laughs> but uh, I know, what is that, what could that possibly mean? You had to work up to it. I don't, uh, you're you're an important fellow. You're a chief uh, liberty officer. That's. Okay. <laughs> Okay. That means something in my world, damn it. Well, I've been admiring your, your your work and your writings for a long time. So, And I think, when did we meet the first time? Not this most recent time. But, uh, where was it? Where did we meet the first time? I can't quite remember. We met in Pittsburgh after your speech at yeah. Duke um, last okay. year. Just last for like year. a couple minutes. Yeah. yeah. And then again we met in Pittsburgh, right? Um, only once in Pittsburgh. I've only seen you in real life twice. Um, and this, okay. the Philly thing was the most recent one, and that okay. was the most rewarding. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Philly. That was a good conference, actually. Didn't you think that went mm -hmm. well? Yeah, I it wasn't good. I spoke at the Pittsburgh one the week after, so I'm a little biased. But the Philly one was a lot of fun. So. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was good, and and I can tell you, it was much better than the Harvard one. Oh. Um, Harvard. but. Yeah, the Harvard one was disappointing. You know, you think, oh well, that's that's everything that's important in the world is to go to Harvard or something. But it, it just, you know, ended up being just a not not quite what what all the all that you hoped it would be. I know um, a kid who went to Harvard for a semester, and he was not impressed. And he's a very smart guy, so that's usually what I think of when I think of Harvard now. What's he doing now? He's gonna be an orthopedic surgeon, and I was trying to talk him out of being a medic in the armed forces. Um, still working on that. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So Corey Massimino allegedly is gonna wander in here a little later, but I think we're gonna jump into our proper official written down type topics. Um, and I wanted to start with. What might be a shorter one, um, and that's the Obama and immigration thing. He's supposed to give his, um, I guess by the time some people watch this, it'll be a little out of date, but he's supposed to give his big speech about his big executive order amnesty type plans at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and I've seen mostly on the Internet, I've seen a lot of libertarians praising this. Um, but I kind of get the uncomfortableness, right, because we're, we're depending on an executive order. Um, to do something good, and I guess I'm wondering how uncomfortable we should be or shouldn't, uh, assuming that we actually kind of like this 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 plan to to give amnesty to a lot of immigrants who were not here with their proper papers and all. Well, we obviously do like the plan, right? I mean, it's it's fantastic, and we also recognize that the Congress is is uh, going to be forever tangled up in this whole subject and would never actually do the right thing. So, <clears throat> so yeah, an executive action like this seems entirely reasonable and yet I understand your point it's like so we favor, little, yeah. right we favor we favor you know sort of dictatorial executive uh, impositions uh, that are that are not even slightly democratic when they when they when they go with the things we like mm -hmm. and and then when they do things we don't like we criticize the, the means by which they're done right so there's an element of, yeah <laughs> There's an element of hypocrisy, hypocrisy here, uh, for sure. Um, the only thing, you know, and I'm not even sure I, I would know what to say about that exactly because we do live in an executive-style dictatorship, uh, as compared with it, as what I understand of the original framing of the, the 
the, the Constitution and all that nonsense. Um, you know, c Congress is supposed to have, uh, you know, the the energy behind government was supposed to come from from Congress, you know, through the people like that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then over the course of a couple hundred years, we, you know, we developed this nation-state apparatus, so this gigantic executive branch that has virtually all power. And Congress, if you look at the organizational charts of government, has very little control over anything. I mean, they, they you know, it's like they can decide what newspapers are on display in the in the reading room of the Library of Congress, uh, but not not much more than that. Not much more. Yeah, it's quite extraordinary how disproportionate the executive. I mean, for all in, for all intents and purposes, the executive branch is the state as we know it. You know, it's certainly so, shorthand. Like if you talk about the state, you're, you know, you might just say Obama did X, Y, and Z, and you mean yeah, the whole federal apparatus. At least I do that. Right. Treasury Department, Housing and Urban Development, Labor Department, NSA, you know, Housing, Housing, whatever, the, the Homeland Security, and uh, Pentagon, I mean, the, the whole of the government that we know about is a, essentially the executive branch. That's really true. Which is not to say it's the same thing as Obama, because it, it operates independent of any of the will of any executive. Um, so, and, you know, the other thing, there's a little bit of a Roman history here that that is a little bit creepy, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that the Republic, you know, became an empire was because of the corruptions inherently in the empire that were inherent in the empire. You know, the the, the legislature is always tangled up. You know, the senators are always arguing with each other. There's this massive graft and corruption, and so uh, and so Caesar's took control in response to this corruption. No different from 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 Hitler, really, essentially. So there's a there's a kind of a long history of of dictators uh, assuming power in light of the political fail failings of of legislatures, you know. So I kind of I kind of get that. Um, uh, all that said, I th I think it's all there's an element of hypocrisy to here too, because I mean I'm sure we're going to see conservative Republicans denouncing. And they're they're doing this already, right? Mm -hmm. For all the wrong reasons, of course. I mean, For all the wrong reasons, right? So they're against these kind of actions when they when Obama's doing something that they don't they want him to do, um, and which I think is really the the real hypocrisy, actually. You know that that's what's really going on here. So I mean, if I were if I were president, I mean, God forbid, right? <laughs> but um, you know, I would use whatever power I could to give as many as much liberty to as many people as I possibly could. You know, I mean, I think so. Yeah, let's just say is that why not? Why not? We are not hypocrites. We're actually advancing a consistent principle. When power is used to uh, to bring more people liberty, to overcome those who are denying others liberty, I think that's a just use of power. I mean, it, it's better than the alternative. I mean, it's better than not doing it because him not doing it is not going to reduce his. It's not. I don't, I'm not seeing it reducing his powers. He's still going to believe that he has all the rights that he possesses. Um, people on, on, on sort of uh, Facebook libertarian groups were saying, well, Ryan Calhoun, the Center for a State of Society guy, was saying like, oh, I guess we, like the king's got to keep all their prisoners in the cell until the revolution's all over with. I mean, there's an element of just, like, how, how could you protest this? Um, because it, it, it's, it's sure to be sort of a stop and force, stop, I mean, it, it's stop enforcing the law, I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to say. Right, and we shouldn't object to that unless right. we were constitutionalists. Um, Joe, are you a con are you too constitutionalist for this conversation? No, I I was just gonna say you know I guess the key is just to pick the right president and we'll just keep going through them until we find one that you know grants us the liberty that we deserve. Mm. And that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's that could kinda, backfire. <laughs> right, I mean that's kind of how it's going at this point anyway. I mean like. Jeffrey said that Congress, I don't think they'll ever pass anything on immigration until, you know, maybe if there's enough illegal immigrants, you know, it can shift the balance of Congress or whatever, but it's, you know, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So, you know, what do we do? Do we, I'm a little more on the fence, I think, because I don't, I don't like the way it's going with the executive power, but, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, it's hard to be against in this instance, but what about the next time Obama uses, you know, the executive action? Is it hypocritical to be against it then? You know, yeah, it is, but, I mean, I guess it's small victories here and there. 
You know, I think, I think you, you, you make me realize something, an uh, important fact here. The Immigration and Naturalization Service and the State Department and all uh, the U.S. passport offices and the citizenship, whatever, yada, yada, all operates under the executive branch. So all this executive order really amounts to is a very tiny sliver of freedom, freedom uh, in the sense that uh, he's declining to use the powers of the state against a certain number of pe people who have the right to be here and work here anyway. So um, I'm just, you know, thank you, thank you for your comment because it makes me realize that this isn't an act of power. It really is a declining to use power in specific instances, which I think we should always celebrate. What do you yeah. think about that, Lucy? <laughs> Decline, I mean, declining to use a power or freeing somebody from the jail of, like, waiting to be deported. And I don't... If we were strict constitutionalists or strict process-oriented people, I guess there would be a reason to object to this more. But the point of being um, ridiculously, unnecessarily radical is that you're worrying about the individuals and you're not worrying about well, we didn't go through the process and we didn't count this and, 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 and sign that and that sort of thing. Um, it, it is an anar it's a very anarchistic idea to say that we don't care how it happens as long as people are freer. It's, it's beyond what conservatives are comfortable with, certainly, even if they weren't weird on immigration. Which is weird because Ronald Reagan, their their, their BFF, um, had a, had a giant amnesty thing in like '86, um, and at some point they really switched around on immigration and became the party of being totally terrified by it. Um, but their boy Reagan, um, I I can't remember how many people his, his amnesty hit, but it was a couple million, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, Reagan was able to get with. I sometimes I think everything we think about politics is is just wrong. Um, <laughs> Because it turns out that it's quite often true that that you like Democrats and and they uh, you know uh, are able to get away with uh, freeing things, uh, deregulating in ways that you wouldn't have expected. Like you know Carter's the one who gave us trucking and oil and telecommunications deregulation mm -hmm. and all the rest of it and banking deregulation and everything. Carter was a wonderful president in retrospect, and Clinton. Did a, a series of wonderful things, like you know, got rid of the 55 mile an hour speed limit, to privatize the internet, you know, privatize the radio uh, 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 waves, and and also you know did the welfare reform famously, right? And that was right. probably a margin of good thing. But uh, meanwhile, Richard Nixon uh, was was terrible. Uh, you know, Bush, the Bush, yeah, the Bushes were were horrible. And Reagan, Reagan, and Reagan was interesting because you know he like, he's the one who uh, uh, negotiated the treaty with Gorbachev to eliminate all nuclear weapons, right? I mean, it didn't actually happen, but still, it was kind of a nice, a nice thing. Nice sentiment, certainly. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's like what you know. You think you know, but then it turns out you don't know. You know. So um, that's why I don't trust politics at all. You know, people say, "Oh, well, you know, so and so would make a much better, much better president than so and so." I don't know how you know that, really. I mean, it's just completely random, it seems to me. You you definitely don't know. Right. I mean, I wouldn't presume that that all presidents were, you know, sort of literally sociopaths. But the idea that the right guy in the, in, in the office would be would fix everything. That is a dangerous idea that I think um, liberals are most committed to. Um, the Carter thing is and libertarians. <laughs> <laughs> well, Many libertarians are into that question too. But our favorite guy in office is going to be you or somebody who abolishes the office. You know, forty-five minutes after freeing people from prison and, and deregulating everything, and, and then you probably <laughs> quit the office. We hope um, you might be corrupted. Even you, it's hard to say. Well, I think I think a big problem with the presidency is that it's not it's not a real institution in, in any in any sense. I mean, uh, you know, okay, so like I'm I'm the chief liberty officer of Liberty.me, and I spend you know a good part of my day trying to keep up with everything that's going on the website, and almost every day there's things going on that surprise me. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a staff of what you know, twelve, fifteen, something like that. Um, uh, network, you know, that's probably no more than a couple dozen or something like that. That's that's got effective admin rights. I can't even possibly keep up with what's going on in my own company. It's too much for one individual, really. 
And um, it's the same. Any business owner knows this, right? You can't possibly uh, keep up with it, no matter how big or small the business is. It's 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 uh, it's too much for for any one person really to manage. Then you think about the presidency, right? So you've got this president who's basically ruling over of this gigantic, the world's biggest government with three million employees. Um, you know, the idea that he could possibly, and he spends most of his time getting briefings and meeting people, dignitaries and and being a marionette on stage, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that he's somehow, man you know, a president can manage anything like a system of government is is is, is utterly crazy. And, and contrary to everything we know about, you know, economizing on time and and so on. I mean, I bet, Lucy, in your own life, and Joey, probably is true for you too, there are things that you're supposed to be sort of in charge of that, you know, you lose track of, right? I mean, like, imagine if you were president of the United States, right? <laughs> the conceit involved is is still amazing. I don't know if you, either of you ever read um, Gene Healy's Cult of the Presidency, which is um, a very good book. And the interesting thing about it is that it's not just about how appallingly royal and pomp and circumstance filled the presidency became over the past couple hundred years. There's a lot of that. There's stuff in there that surprised me, even though I'm pretty good at history. But there's also the, the double-edged thing about the presidency and the way people feel about him now is that they ask too much of him. They, they grant him too much power while asking more still. And that's why the president has to chime in and express his condolences about a hurricane here or there. Or there's I mean, Obama's grand, ridiculously grand, um, I don't remember if it was his, his inaugural speech, all about how the seas were going to, like, you know, fall back because of the global warming, and this was going to be the moment when it all happened. It's absolutely grandiose in just the most irrational way. So, they, I mean, we, we grant them too much power, and then we ask more of them still. They can, they can control the economy, I mean, apparently, completely. <laughs> Right, we, we blame them for everything, and we want them to take credit for everything, just depending on what side we're on. And, you know, largely I think it is, I mean, that's what you said, Lizzie. Obama can't control the economy. He can't do all this stuff. And yet, you know, when we talk about government, like you mentioned earlier, we say, you know, Obama for almost everything. Yeah, the shorthand of it, I do the shorthand all the time, and it's probably not a good habit. Much like saying we invaded Iraq is a bad habit. I was having a tonsillectomy at the time. I was not anywhere near there. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think Joe was either. No, I was there. I, no, I'm... okay, my mistake. <laughs> um, no, it is, it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, we, we have this... What, what happened the other day with, uh, with Obama and the Ebola... A case, you know, I don't know if you remember that there there was a, a panic about a month ago that we were all, get, you know, it's long gone, but we were all going to get Ebola, you know, like tomorrow. Right. And uh, passed, and okay. and you had so you had right, and so you had to walk around with like a mask on your face or whatever, and uh, uh, so that's gone. But there was some nurse in Texas or something like that who like recovered from Ebola. It turns out most people do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, he immediately flew her to Washington and embraced her, you know, and like was, was like hugging her and holding her up. It's so awful. And, right, it's so awful. And and you know, and it's it's appalling because there's a sense in which Obama, you know, is the the not just you know the great bringer of freedom to the world, but also the healer, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's an element of of, of Christ like. About he wants guy, credit right? for the healing. I mean, if he's there, he's associated with a woman being healthy now. Corey Massimino! Um, we of were course, just... if, he, if Ebola had spread, he would have been the chief. If she had died, you know. Well, that's just the, the thing. You know? <laughs> right. uh, that's exactly it. So, so you can't you can't do anything right, really, right? So you you know, like like I was having you know, heaping disdain on this guy for embracing the the recovering Ebola person. As if he had healed her in some way, but but if he if he doesn't do something, then suddenly he's he's a, he's attacked, you know, for ignoring the Ebola crisis. So he's supposed to heal the world. What the hell is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> it almost but, makes him defend the presidency, and we obviously can't do that because that and, be and then it becomes a referendum on Obamacare, and you know how it didn't save us from <laughs> Ebola. So. From Ebola. <laughs> it will, Joe. Give it time. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, but that's exactly it. I mean, I think your point is <coughs> well taken. I mean, the problem is not so much any particular president. The problem is the presidency itself. Mm -hmm. That's that's the great evil. And that's why um, the people who say, oh, well, you, you got to respect the office if you don't respect the man. And I actually went to the White House press correspondence dinner once as a, as a guest of the politics editor of the Denver Post. And I didn't applaud once. And it was hard not to because... Just the sort of skin crawling situation of the, the the earnest applause for the president, and I just I don't know if I would have gone straight to hell if I had applauded as a libertarian, but I really yeah. it's the man and it is the office. It's all it's it's a, it's all of it. Damn it! And speaking of that, I, I'm gonna try to make that transitional. Oh, and also here's Corey and Corey Massimino. Um, I don't know. No, ask, ask, I, would, I want to know. I want to know about Corey's opinion about this. I mean, do you think it's an act, act of executive dictatorship and abuse to to uh, to amnesty so many illegal immigrants like this, or do you think it's a, 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 a consistent with the libertarian outlook? I think it's completely. I think libertarians should be completely fine with it. I think immigration laws are so obscene that I really don't mind the president. Um, doing that. I mean, I think from a position of, I don't think anyone has a moral duty to respect a law just because it's a law, right? So, I mean, I'm fine with using whatever means necessary to get rid of bad laws. Yeah. I mean, almost, well, no, executive orders, I guess precedent comes into play as well. Like, passing a new law sometimes can be worse because you're yeah. making sure that someone's going to read carefully with a fine-tooth comb and say, well, the word the right here means that we get to put you in jail for fun. I mean, I mean, the element of law is look at the precedent and, and like how could we interpret this to grant, make it what we want it to be. And, I mean, I don't know. I, I, that could be worse, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the sill in the car, carbidi, carbides. Car, pardon? Car, carbides, you know, Greek stuff. Greek stuff? You Believe, always... Uh, I believe Sting sang about it in a police song. Jay, you're, both, you're, more, you're more acquainted with both police songs and with Greek history than I am, so I'm going to let you keep that one. Cause, Rock and Hard Place. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 tried, I picked up Mom's impression that Sting is a douche, so I haven't played attention to the police in a well, while. I was talking about the, the Greek, the Scylla and the Caribidis or whatever, you, how you say it. Okay, if, if you can pronounce it, that would help us more. Excuse between two <laughs> evil. Oh, well, yeah, I don't want to do that. Yeah, no, okay. Um, Corey Mesmero so, writes for a million different things, like Center for Stateless Society, and he's a campus coordinator for Students for Liberty, and he wrote for my blog one time, and he's written for Anti War. Um, twice, I wrote for your blog twice. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, so he writes lots of good things. And you're in post just because you're so, uh, you know, adamantly against us for no reason. I'm adamantly only you. I'm adamantly against you, Corey. Well, just your whole, that's, your whole that's existence. A, I mean, that's understandable. Yes. Um, and Corey recently wrote something that just annoyed everybody about rape culture and spontaneous order and. No, it's not annoying. Someone offered to give me a hug on Twitter. <laughs> You know, um, I, I don't know if you want to go into this a little bit, but... Oh, God. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. We don't. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, Charles Johnson's article, original article on this, challenged me fundamentally. I mean, it, it, my head exploded when I read it. And um, when I saw him the next week of the anarchist meetup, you know, I was like, you know, ready to strangle him and all this stuff. I do. I, 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 I have to say, though, that over time, he did shift my view a little bit in his direction. Um, to the point that I, I feel like I'm a little bit a little bit uh, more adapted to that point of view. So by the time uh, you know the Corey Massimino's article came out, I was I was prepared for it and I didn't I didn't I didn't become apoplectic or something when I read it. What was your objection initially? Was it the premise because Charles doesn't argue that rape culture exists; he just assumes it. Was your premise that was was your objection that you don't think it exists, or was your objection that you don't think spontaneous order can be applied to that? Both. But I would want to qualify that um, in a number of different ways, and I don't know if we want to get into it. But um, 
I, I understand what he's saying about spontaneous order. There's something that rubs me wrong about using that, that term to, to describe something that's so egregious. Um, the, the idea of rape culture strikes me as being, there's a grain of truth to it, and maybe more than a grain of truth to it, but it, it, seems, it seems to be more of a Hegelian notion of, of a sort of structural... Um, so, social uh, social uh, dynamics kind of kind of idea that's very it, it reminds me of Marxism in a in a way um, because it it removes individual volition and intention from 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 the problem. Um, I, but and yet I or think it finishes for, it at least. I mean, I don't know yeah. if it removes it entirely, but it definitely downplays it. And it I know does, that that it downplay, yeah. that's bothered some some rape organization um, rain. I forget what that stands for exactly, but they, they actually wrote that they, they, they don't like the term rape culture because it, they, they decided it, it downplays the culpability of individual people. Um, exactly, and this, this is a potential problem. I see, it, stri it strikes me as less, less focused on crime and more focused on ideology, and that, that worries me. It's not specifically about the act of violence itself. It's just about the kind of cultural norms and societal mm -hmm. attitudes that comes out of the act of violence. I mean, yeah. I made the analogy, and because actually just a few hours ago, someone wrote on Liberty Me a response directly to me for that right. article, and I read it in the comments. I uh, made the analogy that just, I mean, she, uh, the author, Sarah Meyer, she made the point that uh, rape is just an individual act of violence, uh, and it just, so I, she didn't want to go any further with saying there was such a thing as rape culture. But for, uh, for me, it's just the same as state violence. State violence is the same I don't think it's on the same magnitude in individual acts of taxa taxation or something compared to rape. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that state violence is an, in is an individual act of violence, but the kind of culture that it creates, it becomes normalized. I get and that. I, 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 I see the taxation as theft, even though it is. I, I totally but, get what you're saying. But, but the, yeah, the problem is the problem is that it's, it's very much like, like, like Marxism in the sense that, you know, um, you posit this sort of irreconcilable conflict between capital and labor, um, and, and you say that that's the dynamic of history, that's the structural reality in which we live. And then you, the printer says, well, look, I just opened up a print shop and invited this guy to help me out, and I'm paying him to do it. I don't feel like I'm an exploder. It's like, you know, and the Marxist response was, well, you've got false consciousness. You know? <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't know if it's exactly the same. I don't see it as Hegelian because it's saying that it can be altered. It's not saying it's some sort of inevitable course of history that rape culture has to just dominate our society. Uh, you know, feminists are saying that it can be altered. That's why I'm writing an article like this. I don't think it's unpaid. Comparing it to the legitimacy that the state enjoys, I think, is really pushing it, though. I, 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 can, I think I agree with Jeff, actually, because I think that there's something to it as a concept, but I think it's very, very limited. The way that privilege is a thing, but it isn't, and you can't put everything in that box, because... And liberal, like, left feminists love to use these special tools that they have, and I'm not like a right winger and say that there's no truth to anything they say, but I think right. that they're very limited, and I think that rape culture is one of those limited concepts. The Corey, Lucy, and Joe, I have I have a proposed alternative to the phrase rape culture. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm just not about attacking the use of that phrase because there is it's obviously taps into something really important. And my my suggestion is that the right term here is misogyny. Okay. Mm -hmm. Misogyny is an is an ideal ideology. It's a, it's a it's a philosophical outlook on life that expresses itself in a sort of a, an institutionalized and pervasive um, way of of disparaging, putting down, uh, marginalizing women. It's, it shows up throughout the whole of human history. It's always on the verge of of returning. It, it does express itself in our in our contemporary times. You can see a strain of it running through all of history, and it's something that you can can get rid of. It's something you can can you work yourself away from. Um, but it, and it's but it's also individuated in the sense that you like you are either acting out of a misogynistic outlook or you are not. And and so that the term misogyny is really good because it doesn't kind of partake of this Hegelian historical dynamic, you know, as if there's something taking place we don't know about, you know, like the spontaneous society of the spontaneous order. It's a specific conscious uh, loathing of women as women, and an attempt to diminish and and marginalize them for that reason. So but I I'm, far prefer talking about the general problem of misogyny over uh, uh, over the structural rape culture idea. 
I, I mean, obviously, I think misogyny is an important issue too. But I think rape culture can can be simultaneously useful because not only is it more specific, but uh, people often forget that rape culture often uh, can affect can negatively affect men. So you can't say the same about mm-hmm. you know misogyny is just about the kind of the way men treat women. Rape culture can have a negative effect on what men too. For example, the way. Um, uh, men tend to under-report rape because, you know, they feel like the, they either can't get raped or they feel a deep, uh, not as masculine as if, if they get were raped or something. I mean, it hurts men, too. Right. But that's what, I mean, feminists also use that, even the patriarchy, which I don't use either um, as terminology, but again has, um, they, they, all, they like to say that the patriarchy hurts men, too, and the idea that a man wouldn't want to report a rape because it would make him weak, they would put that under the category of, oh, that's the patriarchy for you. I mean, there's no empirical truth to any of this. It's all an interpretation of, of some things that occur. And what bothers me about liberal feminists to the ends of the earth is that they truly act as if the people who don't use their word choices are you know, advocating for their op- opposition. So they're advocating for rape culture. Sure. Yeah. That's right. That's, I mean, I think that's, a really, that's a good point. So, Corey, I'm I'm really I'm slightly curious about your position on this because I, I, t- I tend to trust, probably wrongly, but I tend to trust your instincts and and your <laughs> politics and your outlook and 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 I take you very very seriously actually as a thinker. Um, um, is there is there nothing is there is there, is there no aspect of this notion of rape culture that that makes you a little bit squeamish, in light of what you understand about. You know the 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 sort of Hegelian Marxist uh, historical deterministic um, view that all of history is driven by these anonymous uh, forces of conflict we can't control. I mean, is, there, is, there, is there nothing about this rape culture idea that troubles you in light of that? Even given that most of its proponents are are sort of partake of that ideological uh, orientation. Again, I I don't I don't think. Uh, anything about rape culture implies that it's it's inevitable or anything like that or uh, I mean I, it's just a product of the way people act within our culture I don't I don't think I don't really think it has to be kind of Hegelian in the sense that you're saying where it has where history drives towards rape culture I think it's completely avoidable I mean, although there might be feminists that think it is that way but I think they'd be wrong well, so when I read Andrea Dworkin, what I what I read is somebody who says there's irreconcilable, intractable conflicts embedded in the structure of society that society itself cannot solve, mm-hmm. absent some gigantic upheaval. And when I read things like that, that's you, bullshit. You think I've misrendered her? No, no, I'm saying that 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 idea is bullshit. That there's some sort of reconcilable okay. between men and women. Yeah. yeah, free will. That's total bullshit. That. Uh, it's just like you said with Marx and labor versus capital. Like it's just complete nonsense. It, it okay. screws it up for the actual people that are saying that these things are within our power to change. It screws it up yeah. for people who are actually proposing to change these things through the way we act towards uh, the problems of rape. Uh, it's not. I just think that's total BS. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just I I just prefer the solution of talking about the actual problem, which is which is which is uh, misogyny. I mean, which is a real factor. I mean, you know, from from the ancient world, you know, you can read it, read about it in Plato. You can see it in the <clears throat> witch burnings, but long before the Protestant Reformation, you you see it in the legal disparagements of of of, of women in, in Islamic world today, and and in, and the United States today, and and all sorts of forms of discrimination. Um, and the availability of birth control, the the fact that w- women's w- wombs are threatened to be nationalized every four years, and 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 elections, and so on and so on. I mean, you know, um, misogyny is a very big reality in our in our world today, and 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 always has been throughout the whole of history. Ebbs and flows, takes different forms. At least for me, intellectually, it makes a lot more sense to just to just talk about that pervasive problem. It's funny that you mention it going back to Plato because uh, my favorite philosopher, I guess probably my favorite philosopher, Aristotle, uh, had a good line that, um, well, actually, looking back, it was not good at all. It was horrible and wrong. But he said that uh, mirrors turn red if women menstruate in front of them. Um, yeah, that's true. So yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure if anyone like empirically tested, <laughs> um, like if anyone went back and you know and looked like maybe Aristotle was onto something, but I don't think he was. Well, look, what believe. apropos of what the fuck was that? What? <laughs> apropos of what the fuck oh. was that, Corey? 
<laughs> I, I missed the transition to that. When you said Plato, it made me thought, made me think of that Aristotle line that I just really like quoting for some reason. I don't know why. Oh. Yeah, well, it's particularly riveting. The history of misogyny is a is a brilliant and exciting thing to read about. Actually, I mean, it's like it's it's just utterly amazing. I I didn't realize, you know, until I began to dip into this literature that that you know, I mean, as you as you probably know, I'm I'm a uh, uh, a Catholic, and I didn't realize that that uh, one of the popes, I forget now which one, pre Borgia, you know, we're talking about 13th century, maybe something like that, had issued a papal bull, um, a, a, a warning women not to have sex with the devil, and um, <laughs> and yeah, that's a good tip. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> And uh, and said there was a pervasive problem that he had heard very disturbing reports from all over uh, Spain and Germany that many women had been having sex with the devil and, and he was very troubled by this and uh, and and it led to just a rash of witch burnings. I mean, oh, and no, I it's, not, eh, it's not funny anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I mean, it's just it's an incredible thing to read about. And this is the the Pope, right? I mean, so this is just nuts. This is anyway. Can this I is just one little chapter. I have a favorite pope. I'm not Catholic, and I don't know much. Um, and I honestly don't remember his name. But at some point during the Black Plague, he was one of the non-Rome-based like other popes. During the Black Plague, he he issued a directive to not kill all the Jews because turns out you know they weren't causing this apocalyptic plague. Um, and we're talking the 14th century, and you know blaming the Jews for everything was unfortunately something that was happening quite recently. So that guy's my favorite pope. I forget his name right now, but I thought I needed to speak well probably, of a pope. Probably one of the Borgias. Uh, the Borgia popes were actually very close with the Jews, uh, mm. which is just great. I mean, the more you the more you, you read about the Borgias, the more you like them. I mean, they gave us great art. You know, they were all in favor of commerce. Uh, you know, there were missteps along the way, and so on and so on. But um, this is a nicely enlightened thing. To very. Uh, anachronistically enlightened thing to announce that, you know, because yeah. <laughs> God only knew what was causing the Black Plague back then, but he was pretty sure it wasn't the Jews, and that was nice. Well, maybe he decided it was women. <laughs> I haven't checked no. on that. That's a good point. <laughs> mm. I was, Lucy, I was going to make one interjection, unless we want to move on. Like, to popes? No, go on, Joe. <laughs> no, it was going back to rape culture. Okay. I think the word is, it's almost used as a buzzword now to kind of gather support for it. And it's, I mean, I don't quite understand using rape as kind of the all-consuming word when it's more, you know, it's the use of force against women is, I think, more apropos of what's been going on throughout, you know, all of human history, basically. And, you know, I think it is you know, getting better now, but it's still, you know, force is the issue here. It's, you know, ability to take over someone's life and control them you know, through either state means or, you know, laws or whatever else, you know, the patriarchy. For, I, mean, I agree force is ultimately the issue, right? I'm against force, but, I mean, I f it seems undeniable to me that culture affects the way force is used. And again, with the, with the state, again, it's totally different in degree. But the only reason the state is able to get away with all the violence and theft that it uh, uh, gets away with is because the culture allows for it. People just are like, oh, okay, well, it's, uh, you know, I'm just paying, you know, what I owe to the state, like, to, for services or whatever, like it's a, that's why like we're trying to change culture ultimately, right? Because then that in turn affects what the state's able to do, what's able, what's able to get away with. What I don't get uh, is that where the the message that somehow rape is not something to take seriously. I mean, I, I know that there are people who legitimately ask, "Oh, what was she wearing?" etc. And they they do, but I don't know the wherever that message comes from. The message that the state is legitimate and when it murders, it's not murder, and when it kidnaps, it's not kidnapping, that message is very easy to see. I don't know, I mean, if there is a subtle, you know, whispering from culture that says, well, you know, that that slut was wearing a miniskirt, so it doesn't matter what I did to her. I mean, I don't see that. I think if the group, well, rape is inherently difficult to prove most of the time, which is terrible for victims and terrible for accused people. True. But if you know it happens, most I, th I think most people they know it's bad. Uh, maybe that's too optimistic, but 
the pessimism within the phrase um, is also something I take issue with. You know, I have, I have a, a, a kind of broader, broader uh, uh, theory about uh, about everything that's going on today, where we're attempting to. A good example is this recent legislation where colleges are um, attempting to uh, a ask, in the case of you know, sex. Um, for what? What is the phrase? It's like uh, affirmative consent is the affirmative phrase. Affirmative consent, which, which by the way, strikes me as a complete libertarian idea. I, I think that you know when, when you when you go into the convenience store and buy a, buy a candy bar, you're looking for affirmative consent that you can you can walk away with it. And, you know, I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But you know what? What's what? What the problem is trying to enshrine what used to be considered part of the. Um, Court of taste and manners and 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 decorum and decency on the part of men is now being mm -hmm. legislated and imposed by law, and 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 the question uh, really is like why are we so driven to want to use law where and where really we should be taking recourse to to you know culturally structural institutions and manners. That that emerge from our natural inter interactions of human beings, of one with another. And I, here's my answer to that. Uh, I, I think in the course of the 20th century, a war in particular shattered uh, people's sense of, of decorum and decency, and 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 blew away uh, uh, that kind of male chivalry that that had accumulated over the course of the 19th century, and just and kind of shattered people's sense of of. Uh, the differences between men and women, and and the the civil ways of engagement, engaging one with the one with another, and kind of broke down civil institutions to the point that we are today, and mm -hmm. now we're trying to repair things and 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 trying to cobble together something like a coherent uh, social structure, so that we can, you know, have social cooperation and a civilized life, and they're using legislation. Uh, to do it, which is not the right means to do it, but I do think that there's a problem, and that that problem really comes down to a, a shattering of of the old standards of, of chivalry. Seems to me. Well, that's what the state tends to do in long run. It always has to destroy civil institutions because if if without the state, the way you affect change is, is to just, first of all change yourself, and then to uh, when everyone when enough people do that, it changes culture uh, automatically. When the state's involved, people don't have to take self-responsibility. They can just say, fuck it, we'll just pass a law, and that's somehow an automatic thing. That just automatically mm -hmm. fixes the problem, and somebody else will do it for me. They don't have to change the way they act. And then right. they somehow suggest it has the nuance that it, it obviously we know it doesn't have. That, um, there's, there's this uh, forever belief that a law will be passed, and all else will follow, and it will all work out just as we hope it will. And we right. know that's not the truth. <laughs> You know the truth in ten thousand cases. We know about black markets. We know that people aren't robots, and that there right. are dangerous consequences when, you know, the prison industrial complex is up for more people to shove into it. Um, That's right. And this is the great, great, and grave problem of statist style feminist mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, agitation. Is that what it's doing is leading to kind of a brutalist blowback, actually. That is very, very scary. Yeah. So it concerns me very much that that uh, this is going on. I'm, I'm I'm obviously highly sympathetic with with the with the with the um, ideals, feminist ideals, but the means uh, that are currently employed in the name of feminism are are creating um, monsters, actually. And, so, and it's, it's really scary. The state kind of codified that. Uh, Oh, go ahead, Joe. I was going to say, you know, the state kind of codified that men were allowed to do these things to women. You know, they were basically property for a lot of human history. And now, you know, liberal feminists are kind of saying, okay, well, you know, the laws just need to change and then everything will be better. You know, they don't kind of see that, like we were saying, you know, these laws, there's always unintended consequences and all this other stuff. And it's just going to, you know, make things worse in the end unless we change culture. Yeah, that's me uh, in the same way that uh, state, the state's left bothers me as self-identified feminist and a self-identified leftist. Because the state's left, their whole uh, their whole narrative is the corporations control the government, so we need more government to fix the problem. And the feminists have rightfully the problem, premise. man. They they have the same premise, uh, but in terms of gender, men control the government, uh, at least major, uh, 
primarily mm-hmm. and historically, obviously. So then, but somehow we need the government to fix the solution of patriarchy, as if the government wasn't the one instituting it and creating it. It's like it's the same fallacy with the status left in terms of corporations and the status feminist in terms of the patriarchy. They both get it wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they both get it wrong, and it's very dangerous because it's actually exacerbating the problem. You know. Um, in the same sense that Richard Nixon's war on pot, you know, led to <laughs> marijuana nation, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, my concern is that this, these, 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 this, this, this branch of feminism that imagines they can use power to bring about their ideals is actually creating a kind of a backlash culture in the form of the, of the men's rights movement, and 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 worse, really. Um, that's that's extremely troubling, and uh, I don't blame I don't so much blame feminists for this because because there's there's they're, they're responding to realities that that are crying out for a, for a fix. But it shows what happens when you get when you get things wrong. You know, it's it's like it's not enough to have the right goals. You also have to write to have the right means too, mm-hmm. uh, or else or else uh, you're going to end up undermining your cause. Hopefully, that's not a call back to um, mass amnesty. As we were wondering about before, uh, you got here, Corey. It's all flat. Times a flat circle, and says this podcast. Uh oh. Um, seems like that should have been a um, segue into something, but since we've uh, gone on this pretty solid but totally unexpected tangent, I don't right. know what to do. Anarchy. Uh, <laughs> quite. Um, I was going to ask. We were going to have uh, Marianne Copenhaver, our, our lovely libertarian girl. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about this without her. Um, we always can. It's also a long. It, 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 it was just the same. The next topic was supposed to be the same damn thing about um, interaction, interacting with the state or not. Um, and I, I, I kind of could spend like two hours trying to pick at um, Jeff's brain about the idea of who the state actually is, which is something that came up a little bit in the um, bitches and bourbon. Podcast um, a couple of days ago. It's an absolutely fascinating topic. I think libertarians are com- completely get this wrong. I mean, it's, it's one of the most extreme, extraordinary things to me that 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 libertarians are are so uh, simple-minded towards the state. I mean, they have this they have this opposition to the state, but it's like very few libertarians have any clue what it is or even curiosity about how it functions. And what constitutes the state apparatus itself? I mean, it's a very silly and simple-minded view of what this of what the state is, and it's hard to find any literature. In fact, if you want to, if you, if you start digging into literature, because I got curious about this about a year ago, because I was going to be giving a series of lectures on the topic, I wanted to understand, you know, what is the state and how it functions. Mm-hmm. Uh, libertarian literature on the subject is incredibly thin and boring and repetitive, as compared with like. Uh, the only really great literature on the state is all written by Marxists. I mean, they, uh-huh. they really they <laughs> understand they understand what the state is and, and and how it works much better than libertarians. I mean, it's 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 an amazing thing, and it was all revealed to me. I mean, <laughs> because you remember in 2012, everybody was wanting my friend, my dear friend Ron Paul, to, to get elected and become president, and they thought that was going to fix everything. And mm-hmm. you know, you just you just you you're just amazed at the level of naivety, you know, there. Like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> Um, you know that you think that this is the answer. You know it's 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 just uh, pathetic and infantile, really, uh, how libertarians tend to think that the state works and and what the true fix is. Because like I say, like I say, you have to go to the extreme left to really get a a, a complex and dynamic some some public choice literature. But really, it's the Marxists who have the the more complicated view of of the state as. Um, much more dynamic and and uh, uh, a human style institution than libertarians really understand it to be. Well, it's our it's our great enemy, so we tend to flatten out its nuances. Like any monster becomes a monster, not you know a human. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would read more Marxist stuff if they weren't such god awful writers. Um, I, I would like to understand <laughs> what exactly. I know enough to be very confused about their, you know, interpretations and um, the labor theory of value and uh, all the stuff about history and a- anything Marxist. I-, I I know enough about it to be very confused. Um, so <laughs> dive in someday. Uh, was it Rothbard in? Where did he write this? Oh, uh, he wrote it in an essay called "Confiscation: The Homestead Principle," uh, and that was during his lefty phase, uh, which he should never have left. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> 
no, don't even defend a uh, post left Rothbard to me. Post he, 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 never, he never fully left Corey. Don't worry. He never fully. He was he was uh, as le- he was like pretty left like. Uh, any, okay. I can let this happen. Uh, no, let's 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 control this. <laughs> a confiscation of the homestead principle, which I don't even know if that's available on Mises.org because they're stupid fucking redesign, but if you find that online, you should read it. It's very short. And Rothbard talks about this. He briefly talks about who the state is, <laughs> and he points out, like Jeff said, it's a human institution. It's made up of people. It's not mm-hmm. bizarre, faceless monolith. It's, it's, it's made up of individuals you know, with their own uh, goals and desires, right? So, um, And then he talks about how... Uh, then how should we consider the military-industrial complex mm-hmm. and, uh, and kind of a com- uh, corporations that are primarily or ma- uh, majority owned by the state? And he was saying that, well, we should do them similarly as p- parts of the state apparatus. And then mm-hmm. he goes on to defend uh, workers seizing the means of production of the military-industrial uh, corporation. Oh, man. Um, no, I told you, Rothbard got pretty left. <laughs> By far, his most seizing any means of production, you're getting well, pretty lucky. I like his argument though because he was saying that basically, since the corporations are primarily owned by the state, that was obviously uh, funded through taxation, so that was illegitimate ownership. So the workers were actually homesteading the capital that they worked on and the land that they worked on, so it was rightfully theirs. Well, that's I mean that's the end, endless question, and this is why it's good to debate with social anarchists like my cousin in the East Bay, black hoodie type of that type of anarchist. Because if you talk to them, it's just, it's so good for your brain to talk about their impressions of property and their impressions of the way the world works. Um, and I wasn't convinced, but it seemed, it felt a lot more worthwhile than trying to tell yet another liberal that, you know, Obama was also a, a douchebag. But, um, I don't know, what was the point of that? I swear there was one. I don't get um, someone calling Obama a douchebag to liberals. Well, okay, no, that, that is a good activity. No, okay, I, I've asked even my dad. My dad is sort of Milton Friedman was kind of his guy. If he gets cranky, he gets more radical, but he's sort of a, he's a minarchist. Um, and I asked him, like, um, I think I asked him once, like, why can't we steal from Yellow Cab? Because Yellow P- Cab has this unfair cartel in, in Pittsburgh, um, and you can't get a cab to save your life. Um, so why can't we just take, redistribute some of the wealth from Yellow Cab, take some of it off the top, because they're, you know, they're preventing... By, by 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 needling at the 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 local government um, to prevent competition, um, and yet they're providing just non-existent service. And his only answer for me was, well, because we don't want to be as bad as the state, which is both a totally unsatisfying and and somehow a great answer to me. Um, when you get into Yes, go on, Jeff. <laughs> well, just um, just just was saying something. One one quick thing about about Murray. Um, you know, Murray learned from uh, Murray's Murray's intellectual apparatus was was complicated. Uh, he was much more Randian than people think. Mm. He was also much more left wing and and Marxian than people think. Um, not in his libertarian value or anything, but he read the Marxists, loved the Marxists for their radicalism. Uh, so he, yeah, he had a richer view of this variously, he didn't always sustain that, but he had a richer view of what the state is than, than most libertarians. It's actually tremendously boring when you get into libertarian literature on the state. Once you get the main message that the state exists and it's bad, mm-hmm. um, it's hard to get much more information from the, the, from the literature on the, on the subject. Whether you're talking about uh, Albert J. Nock or Frank, Frank Chodafall, who had some good, interesting views. You really have to get really into the deeper lefty scholarly literature to, to get a, a clear sense of what the state is and, and what it does. And Rothbard variously did that, you know. His power elite lit, uh, uh, stuff that he really he really got, he understood the complex relationship between between business and government. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a very intriguing uh, relationship. Um, and, uh, and and there's profound implications uh, because what you learn, what I take from from a deeper understanding is that that we have a much bigger problem than just electing the right people. This is really a, a distraction. Um, mm-hmm. um, it's not really the core of the issue. And I, I suspect, Lucy, that you were going to ask about political activism on the part of libertarians. And I, I'm I'm not real quick to put it down all the time, <clears throat> just because. I think there's a certain consumption value there that people really enjoy, and it's demonstrated preference. You like politics, they go for it, you know, whatever. But I'm not, I'm not very optimistic, really, at at all 
about about the prospects of of change from the top down. Really, <clears throat> it seems to me I mean, the change is going to come from the from the bottom up, regardless of political activism. No, there's a practical like the decline of the drug war. Um, you know, politicians are pretending that they've invented this this cooling off of the drug war, but they're really following. You know, they're following behind, and they're seeing that people. 100 million Americans have smoked pot, I believe I looked it up once, and they're following behind and saying, all right, well, I, ju I was just about to mention that, that we should probably decrease these draconian penalties against pot, I swear, I was just about to mention it, and suddenly it's become okay to talk about this thing. Um, and that, even just yeah. that, proves that like the political process can help people, because we're going to help them by not sending them to prison in the first place. And there's actually been this great movement on reducing mandatory minimums and getting the whole um, but part... Lucy, but Lucy, there's more to it than that. And I didn't entirely understand. I was thinking through this the other day because I was talking to somebody who works for the Fully Informed Jewelry Association. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Corey and Joe, I'd be interested in your comments about this. But I wasn't entirely... Like, I hadn't connected the dots yet before she said this. But one of the problems is that prosecutors are actually less and less willing to bring these cases to trial because they can't find jurors who are willing to convict, you know, the, the grandmothers who are using medical, uh, medical marijuana. Uh, they can't so I find... hope that's true. I mean... Yeah, this is a major thing. I mean, we've most of the, of the nullification kind of uh, uh, jury cases we've seen recently are just juries unwilling to send people to, to jail or uh, punish them, even though they've clearly violated the law. And and this is this has diminished the the will on the part of state actors like uh, uh, elected prosecutors to even bring these cases to trial. So we're seeing the laws break down, in in part uh, response to this kind of um, non-compliance, you know, on the part of of regular people. It, don't you find that extraordinary? I, I, to me, that's just really very exciting to think of. I mean, I'm very interested in this process of state breakdown. Like, how does it happen? Yeah, and it's mechanics. I to this is, laugh at it. And this is one of the one of the ways it happens is that people are just like like the state really needs us to bolster it its, its apparatus, and if we're unwilling um, at the margin to 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 make their power possible, it's exactly like Etienne de la Boise said. Eventually, the the power just kind of crumbles. A, this is a very particular instance of that. I'd love to see libertarians document this a little bit more and and explain it a little bit more to us. Like um, the 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 the, the, the it's like a metaphor of the um, uh, people who explore ruin like urban ruins and take pictures and and like that's what we're gonna go on. Jeff. <laughs> say, that's it. It's, it's an interesting mechanism. I never, I, mean, I didn't know that. You know that the people, you know, you know, they see these laws, they think they're unjust, and it's an interesting mechanism that you know, I don't think anyone really. Well, I mean, I'm sure people have, but most people don't think about this kind of other way to kind of circumvent bad laws through, you know, something like juries. And you know, now that the government can't control as much information about marijuana, the more people, you know, learn mm -hmm. about it, you know. These are some of the things, you know, that the government it is kind of causing a breakdown of the government. You know, the more information people get about whether it be marijuana or any other law, you know, they can almost kind of take matters into their own hands if, you know, enough people kind of get the right information. And I think, you know, the rise of the Internet and stuff is helping to accelerate kind of the breakdown of some of these bad laws where the government could control things before, but now that... The information is very yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's right. And it's not just the information, it's the technology in general. I mean, 10 years ago, if you went to a concert, like a Lady Gaga concert, and took in a camera to record it and then and tried to post your video online, uh, you'd be, you'd be faced, to, faced with criminal penalties. Mm -hmm. uh, now, at a, today at a Lady Gaga concert, you know, two-thirds of the audience is holding up their cell phones the entire time, you know, recording the thing. And this is a, another example of civil disobedience uh, of, of sorts. It's breaking down. YouTube, YouTube is law. Yes, absolutely. I think that yeah. touches on the, like, really the two important points. And this goes back to what I was saying about the state uh, basically being propped up by a certain kind of culture. Because I think first you're going to have to have two revolutions. You're going to have the technological revolution, which is going on right now in front of us, 
uh, you know, technology is letting people circumvent so many laws. It's completely making uh, the, uh, the horrible, immoral, inefficient IP laws practically irrelevant now. Uh, uh, the more uh, people use things like torrent and everything. And mm -hmm. after the tech after the technological revolution, after everybody is really free to exchange information uh, at such a fast rate, then you're going to have the culture revolution. Then you're going to change people's minds. And then after the culture revolution, there's it just go, the state is going to go away automatically. I hope that's true. Uh, Joe, do you remember um, the NBC miniseries called Merlin that was on in the 90s? Mm -hmm. I, I know you do. Okay, so at the end, <laughs> at the end, Merlin, like Queen Mob, who's this horrible, um, powerful, no, is she a witch? I don't know. She's a fairy queen. Yes. Whatever. The point is she's evil, and the point, point with these old gods is that if you don't believe in them, they will go away. And so at the end, you know, Merlin's going to do his own thing and stuff, and like everybody, he tells them, they all stop believing in Mob, and she goes away. So that's I'm all hoping right. that's... I'm that's, that's, yeah, that's what yeah. I tend. I, th I thought of that before. The, it helps when you're white and you know have the right technology. The privilege to ignore the state is absolutely a thing. Um, that's yeah. totally a thing. Um, yeah. Most lucky us. What what would you say? The privilege to fight against the state in general. Not everybody has the time or resources. You know, like again, yeah, definitely. And all that bullshit. Like you know, people are like scraping by. Um, but def with the technological revolution, that becomes, uh, you know, people having more free time and more ability to learn about the state. It becomes more and more uh, of a possibility. I just, I ha the idea that if there's just enough information, they're suddenly going to stop being the horrible utopians that state of star. It's a little more optimistic than I am for some reason, though. I don't know. Like, there's, there's enough information out there that you can still just... Enforce your own views that if we get, you know, a lady president, then then misogyny will go away, and et cetera. I mean, there's always there's always a deal to make with yourself if you if you believe that you can fix things in in in, in a state sort of way. I'm um, so glad, in many ways, that 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 Obama was elected because we finally put to rest this idea that somehow if we get a black man as president, that that's going to have, Free Black Americans from from oppression, you know, mm -hmm. that could happen. And and uh, now we're on the second term, and it's still just the same idiotic nation state, ra racist uh, state that there's always been. So I'm I'm hoping that it's going to kind of radicalize uh, people who are concerned about institutionalized race racism and realize that that the the state top down reform is not the way to go. Uh, we need we need we need uh, a more, more structural uh, uh, revolution from below. We need a we need a woman. We need Clinton 2016. <laughs> then everyone will realize it's you know they go on it. Okay, if it's not a black man, let's go to the woman. And then after that, when it still sucks, you know maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe like an Indian or a Muslim, and then. And then yeah. at some point, people are going to say, you know what, it's just the state that's yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. What's the common element here? <laughs> <laughs> Let me do the figures. Oh, yeah. I think I got it. <laughs> well, hopefully they're going to get it. Um, hmm. we're, we're about in an hour now. Thank you, ombudsman. <laughs> well, um, we can always save... I was I was gonna talk about um, horrible Joe. Did you see the Colbert Report thing with the with the free keen people? Have you have you experienced this? No, I, 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 I actually watched it. I watched it earlier today. And, Did you? Yeah, and it's and of course it's decently embarrassing. But on, on one hand, I'm glad that they didn't they didn't mention the Free State Project. It was all about Keen. and it was a little bit of a comedy thing. And you know, I, it's funny. I didn't realize just how annoying that that uh, these, these Robin Hood meter people had had actually become. I didn't. I, I imagine that they were actually helping people and not just you know being you know these little these little trolls out on the street. But uh, <laughs> uh, so it was embarrassing. On the other hand, did you see it, Corey? I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Okay, this is a funny video. So, yeah. Sorry, I don't use the internet that often, really. Social media is not my thing. Okay, uh, so, clearly. Uh, Colbert Report makes makes fun of the freaking uh, uh, Robin Hood uh, parking meter uh, people. And uh, it, 
You know, and and of course, you know, my my the guy who hits my guts for from now to the end of time, uh, Cantwell. You know, comes. Oh, across. he hits us all. I mean, he yeah. seems to be full of. Yeah, I'm a big Cantwell fan, though. Just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and there's a, there's a there's a clip in there where he's he's actually using some, uh, you know, s- s- you know, weaponry against shooting an American flag, you know, for target practice, you know. So it's, so edgy, so yeah. edgy. <laughs> so it's awesome. that's actually the most shocking moment uh, in the entire in the entire report was seeing Cat- Chris Cantwell using. Wait, using Chris Cantwell was on the Col- he was on the Colbert Report. Okay. Oh, the Colbert report. Yes, I... All right, Corey, let me tell you how it went down. Okay, there was. I gotta look this up. Stephen Colbert, there was a little segment from I don't know when, yesterday or the day before, um, and he, you know, interviews free, uh, three people from Free Keen who've been doing what they call Robin Hooding, which is you, you put the uh, money in the parking meters before they expire, which I think is great. That in itself is great, but being macho flash libertarians, they couldn't leave it at that, and they had to go. Follow <laughs> meter meter maids and yell at them down the street. <laughs> Within every second that they were just destroying the state with every thing Wait, they held at the meter maids. What were they doing initially? Putting money in the meters? The parking meters to prevent parking tickets, which is fine. Like, that's good. I like that. Yeah, that's fine. That'll, that'll bring down the state. I don't know. That just, <laughs> like, I don't know. It was, I mean, it's a, it's what I read an essay once. Yeah, I thought where, it was kind of sweet. I mean, you know, it's fine. It's fine to do that. I mean, there's the a slight problem that. I love the money thing. It's the rest yeah. of it that's ridiculous. Right. They're, right. they're right. embarrassing libertarianism. For I everyone. don't think Stephen Colbert even had to do it. Like he didn't have to edit them that much. Like <sighs> the entire segment was literally just look at these idiots. All he could have done was pull up Campbell's site and pe- and it would have embarrassed oh, libertarianism. That's enough. But you know, there's that there's that that other that other guy, that sweet guy who said he's the Ying and the state is the Yang. Mm-hmm. Remember that guy? Mm-hmm. Now he, I don't know him, but he, he, I, I, my heart went out to him. I, just, <laughs> I thought he was very sweet, and you know, look, look, everybody, we know what the problem is. The problem is that libertarians don't have enough to do, right? We're against the state, but we don't know how what to do with that, mm-hmm. other than hate the guts of mom and dad and, and our next door neighbors, you know. But beyond that, we we we're out of out of ideas. Yeah. But, well, I think that's a creative thought, and I, I actually think that this Robin Hood, Robin Hooding ideas, is is a, not a terrible idea. Actually, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. something for people to do. You know, uh, it's it's fine. But yeah, they, to be annoying like that, you know, and we don't know to what extent. You say that Colbert didn't edit it. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> it feels you know. that way in my heart, but I can be wrong. He's he's notorious for just uh, like, asking people the same questions over and over again until you sure. get the answer and. But I, there's a lot. That, there's a lot that we can do, and 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 I I I've obviously I've dedicated a lot of my professional career over the last few years, last couple of years, to figuring out these specifics. You know, mm-hmm. about how we can how we can reform the system from 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 uh, the ground up, just as the left did. You know, a century ago. But I think that's what's really driving this whole thing. Really, is it's just that people just don't they have too much time on their hands. But yeah, to demonize the meter maids, you know, as being the you know the the embodiment of the state, is a little well, bit strange. That's I'm gonna say that the guy who was in Iraq who acted like being a meter maid and keen was more traumatic. Did not <laughs> earn, he did not earn my sympathy in the slightest. I'm not I know what you mean. I know what you there, mean. There's yeah. something at least as repellent about him as as, as about the rest of them. <laughs> I, I kind of hated him on sight. Um, <laughs> The idea that the meter maid is, I mean, like, uh, police use tickets um, and speed traps and such to gain revenue to support their endeavors. Like, that's, we're not going to dispute that. But to start with the meter maid in terms of harassment and to act as if, I mean, I, I don't change my mind about the threat of communism if a schizophrenic guy on the corner yells at me about communism. The idea that Yelling at somebody is going to change their mind is 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 just patently ridiculous. But, but you know, I think what jo- what Joe said is very interesting to me. He, he said, you know, that these people are an embarrassment to libertarianism. They're embarrassing our cause. 
And I, I, I know exactly what you mean, but, but here's just a kind of a warning. The, the more prominent that libertarianism becomes as a kind of ideological force, and in all of its rough edges, and I mean even Cantwell here, all right, uh, um, the, the, the more we're going to be called, the, 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 we're going to see reports like this uh, mm -hmm. by the national media, they're going to make us look really, really bad. I mean, this is, this is the beginning of a long trend. We're... Uh, all of us are going to be cornered, and uh, I, you know this happened to my friend Peter Schiff, right? I mean, he did like a two-hour interview on, on, on I don't know what show it was, but uh, he he said it just in passing that he didn't think a retarded person was worth seven dollars an hour; that they should probably be working for for two dollars an hour, and that became um, like this big national scandal, right? And then everybody was against him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing is that we're not all of us are prepared uh, to deal with the national media in ways that are, that, you know, that are, that, that show us at our best, and yeah. they're, they're going to pick out the thing that's worst about us, you know? So I guess I, my, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit cautious to completely jump on, on the freaking movement and say, look, you made us look like idiots, <laughs> just because I'm afraid, really. I, I'm not afraid, but I, 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 I'm, I, sus, I suspect that if, if um, a national reporter got me in a room for two hours and interviewed me on my views, mm -hmm. that, uh, that and, and it ended up as a 20-second as a segment, you know, uh, on CBS or something like that, that I might come across like a very dangerous and idiotic person, you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, that's the thing. That's the thing with Colbert and Oliver and Stewart and yeah. Salon and Slade and all these other places that right. you know they're 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 looking to kind of catch libertarianism at its worst. To you know, that's why they fucking picked Christopher Cantwell as 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 a guy to to, to right. talk. I mean, about. they know they know that because I've read Cantwell. That's the reason I'm not going to give him much of the benefit of the doubt because he seems fundamentally awful um, for lots of reasons. There's always he expresses himself. But gener generally, though, you're right. I mean, like I was. Uh, the the media gets to control the narrative, and people who look a lot more sane and sensible and respectable um, than, than 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 Cantwell look terrible. I always think of Rand Paul talking about the Civil Rights Act. Um, he was very nuanced back when he was first elected to the Senate. I thought so. I and, thought and so too. Yeah, but you can't, I mean, and then there's this horrible Rachel Maddow interview where she keeps grandstanding and putting words in his mouth, and all he said was, you know, anything that we would say, which is the part where you, you, you tell private in, you know, businesses how to run their private business is the part that makes us a little uncomfortable. But the rest of the Civil Rights Act was basically, like, vitally necessary. But you can't be that nuanced about a subject like that because they, they won't let you, especially if you're uh, fringy at all. They just won't. Yeah, I thought, I thought he was very, very thoughtful in that interview with Rachel, with Rachel Maddow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought he was, he was searching deep and trying to solve a kind of a fundamental uh, practical issue in light of uh, libertarian moral concerns. I mean, I, I thought he, he, he was brilliant. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that kind of nuance and depth, you know, it's just lost on people like Maddow. Mm -hmm. Jeff, Jeff, what are your thoughts on Rand Paul, by the way? <laughs> we, don't, we don't have the time for that, Corey. Sorry. Okay. Mute, Lucy, mute him. <laughs> he hasn't been on in months. I'm not going to mute him. I missed him. Corey. <laughs> oh, it makes me laugh. It's still, it's a fun, it's a, by now a meme. But, um, oh, it's, yeah, it's definitely. But it's very funny. <laughs> I still like it. Did you all see that um, the guy in uh, one of the Facebook groups where he was arguing that we uh, shouldn't end the drug war? He was an anarchist. He was saying he was saying we shouldn't end, end the drug war because we should, like a slave wouldn't beg his master for for like food or something. Nice. That's <laughs> it made no sense. <laughs> but it was so funny. It was the. I mean, that's the type of person who needs to sit in a dark room and just hug their principles tight and never leave. You know, honestly, I am so against this idea of a libertarian movement. Um, I, I feel like I think we need no, every. You're not. <laughs> I, no, I am. I don't think we need a movement. What I want is a decentralized, uh, a decentralized assembly of 
of wackos and, and crazies of every conceivable sort. That sounds nice. Just break down. Yeah, and, and every in every way, without any central organization, no leaders, uh, no message. You know, to me, that's that's the right that's the right way forward. So I would, I would I would even defend Cantwell's right to, to to shoot the American flag with an AK-47 or whatever the hell he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the least objectionable thing among some things that he's done. But it was the single most shocking thing on that site, <laughs> you have to admit. Well, it's it at least shocking. It, it's the part that would shock the right, to be sure. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the idea that the meter maids, like the state starts with the meter maids, so we better start harassing them there is it's foolish. Um, the whole, <sighs> yeah, the, the, I don't know. Again, like we, we, we've got this for ages now. Um, and the whole who is the state thing, I still almost feel like I could talk about it more and more. Well, we could, we could talk about it. Let's have another podcast on that subject, actually, because it's a, it's a really interesting topic. And I think okay. we need to think more seriously about it. Yeah, we need to think seriously part? about it. What's that, Court? What's that? Cantwell's part. You think Cantwell's part of the state? Yeah, definitely. I bet money on it. I bet Bitcoin. I bet Dogecoin. Lori Rice is watching. Lori, I'm going to bet Dogecoin that Cantwell. That's how you know I'm serious about this. <laughs> okay. Um, either a cop or just like the dumbest man on the planet. <laughs> um, well, Jeff, if you at some point later in life want to do, want to get a, a who, what is the state, who is the state panel together, I would uh, like. To very I, I would, I would love, I would love that. I would love that idea. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so intrigued by that topic. I, I feel like it's my next big thing I want to write about because. Um, it's complex, uh, but it's it's crucial because libertarians are ridiculously simple-minded about the topic. We don't know our enemy, mm -hmm. which is amazing to think about. But it's just true. Um, yeah. Well, if you write about it, that'll give us a hook to talk about it some more as well. Okay, we'll do it. Um, all right, we'll do the final quick segment, which is where you guys tell me one or two things you've been enjoying in the past week that's not at all related to politics. Um, and we'll start with Joe, I guess. I got nothing. Yeah. Oh, come on. You. This comes up every podcast, Joe. You got nothing? I've been playing a lot of Minecraft, all right? Okay. I'm building my own world. It's beautiful. <laughs> You're okay. building things. That's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. You're building things and creating things. Minecraft, that's what it's all about. <laughs> See, Joe? That was fun. <laughs> Corey? Oh, it's just spontaneous. Everything just... <laughs> you know, there's no government in Minecraft. Just my free will. <laughs> Anarchy. Right. Very randy interview. Enemy of Anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Corey, what about you? Uh, the past week? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've been really busy. I went. I was. Yeah, I didn't do anything besides politics. You guys are. What, what kind of answer is that? <laughs> what kind? Y'all are bad at this. Corey, um, you're, a, you're a brilliant, uh, uh, amazing person. What about, what about, why don't you talk about why don't you talk about the time that you went to this commie co-op and slurped down a bunch of veggie stew? That place was good. <laughs> Get out of here. All right, no, so it was disgusting. And then and then <laughs> and by the way, after we left the commie co-op with those that was, that was, that was <laughs> looking out vegetable gruel to us. We immediately <laughs> went, went back to the conference and, and ordered, you know, beef burritos. You know, let me just point that out. That, that was, uh, made us happy. So, anyway. The co-op no, co place was good. Like, I don't think you really gave it a fair shot. <laughs> when, when did this take place? I mean, I mean, Utopia. Some, uh, like, bastards of the Utopia. Don't speak yeah, so, of it. Never been. Don't speak of it. All right, never mind. There, there was no... There was no consumer service at this place. I mean, it was just, I felt like <clears throat> I was in some dystopian novel written in the 1890s in Germany or something. You know, it was just, it was just, it was just, just horrible. You're going to um, ruin this business. What? It wasn't this place's business. All right, man. Who's this libertarian that's talking about how shitty our store is? <laughs> what's what's, what's them there? <laughs> Okay, can I just say can I just say something that I'm enjoying something <laughs> immense, immensely right now? Yes, and that of course. Is, and that is the 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 inevitable and like like accelerating collapse of the pretentious and pompous wine industry. Okay. Uh, I'm so thrilled <laughs> by it. But... That's more Schadenfreude than I expected uh, from you in terms of the uh, businesses. Um, no, but I'm I'm sick of these people and their and their names and their and their fun, their fun 
plants and their stupid corks, and you know everything associated with wine. You have to smell it. And you have to have a special tool to pull it out, and you know they're breaking the bank, you know, just to drink the crap. And, and I'm just fed up with it all. And and I love that people are catching on to this whole racket and buying large uh, uh, jug wines with screw tops that, that turned out to be actually you know, completely delicious. So this is, this, is, this is extraordinary to me. And it's a rev revolution taking place. It's true you haven't read about it, um, but that's the way revolutions happen. You know, they're just like, they seemingly happen overnight, but you can see, you can see the foundations of this entire, entire you know, global cartel of looters and scammers who are just, 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 just collapsing. They're on their last legs. I can just feel it. Information. People, can, the consumer is getting all their information. They're, they're getting it. They're figuring it out. And it's thrilling. I mean, it shows that, you know, uh, you know power just can't last in the face of, uh, of, of, of when, the, when the revolution, it's when the time for the revolution is here, it's, it's here, and nothing's going to stop it. So that's where we are. Up with Carlo Rossi and down with Moshe de Pop de Bleu. <laughs> that's what I have to say. <laughs> Lucy's, Lucy, your microphone's not working. I think the wine cartel's worse than the state, like, by far, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like, it is. Destruction. That, I would say they're at least as evil. From, at least. Like, yeah, probably people spend more more on, on, on pompous, pretentious wines every year than they do on taxes. So I think you've got a good point there. Lucy, is your microphone working yet? No, it's no, not. The microphone does not work. The show because we've lost, we've lost our host. So, Lucy, I, I think I'm going to wrap it up, if if I may take this one. Okay. Uh, like, oh, wait, no. She's giving me the finger. <laughs> Control freak. <laughs> Nothing, Lucy. It's not happening, Lucy. All right. Well, this has been another exciting episode of the Stag Blog. Or people... What? what? Oh gosh, she's giving me the finger again. She it up. <laughs> oh, now she's typing. Your, your microphone is not working, please. Susie, just type what you were going to say. Ask them to promote their stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Corey, or Jeff, you go first. Okay, Jeffrey. Yeah. Uh, uh, come to liberty.me. We've got the most exciting content of, of any liberty minded site on the web. So people should not just uh, come, but they should join. 30 days for free, and then you're in for just a few bucks a month. It's the way to go. Liberty.me. All right, Corey, where can we um, see your works? Yeah, uh, just continue the fight against the wine cartels, continue harassing meter maids, and invest in Dogecoin are the three main things. <laughs> <laughs> that has nothing to do with what you've been writing, but thank you anyway. Uh, if anyone wants to take a shot at Lucy while she can't speak, feel free. Um, uh, Lucy, Lu Lucy, you don't have a microphone. You can see Lucy's work at Rare, uh, Vice, um, Antiwar.com, the Stag blog. She writes for whoever. She's a mercenary. Um, Where are you, anything Lucy? Else? Anything else, Lucy? Okay, I think we're good. This has been episode 12 of Politics for People Who Hate Politics. Uh, I'm Joe Steigerwald, and Lucy Steigerwald is microphoneless, but if she was here, she would say, see you next time. Bye-bye.